Hello historians, welcome to the post-World War I Climate Notes, Unit 6.2. Given marginalia notes and several video clips, students will be able to recall what the Treaty of Versailles and 14 points documents were, describe the difference between them, explain why tension would exist in the post-World War I climate, and predict how this ties into totalitarian regimes by answering six exit ticket questions with 80% accuracy, and at least using five predetermined vocabulary terms. Now before we actually jump into the notes, we need to do a little bit of review on the Paris Peace Conference. And specifically, if we remember, at the Paris Peace Conference, many different types of countries were invited. Now, all of these countries that were invited were either considered world powers, minor powers, or colonies. And based on the name they were given, they had different levels of powers and different levels of ability to speak and make decisions at the conference. Out of all of those countries invited to the PPC, we know that the world power countries were the most powerful. And out of the world power countries, we know that three countries known as the Big Three pretty much dominated the PPC. Those countries were the United States, led by Woodrow Wilson, the president, David Lloyd George, the prime minister of Great Britain, and George Clemenceau, the president of France. These three men are going to be the leaders of the big three countries that pretty much made most of the decisions at this Paris Peace Conference. What you're going to do now is using your content knowledge and the information provided in this video, you're going to fill in the blanks below, reflecting the three beliefs and actions each of the big three wanted to achieve during the Paris Peace Conference. If you take a look at the fill in the blanks down here on your notes, you can see that these fill in the blanks deal with either how each country felt Germany should be punished, how each country felt about the League of Nations, and how each country felt about blaming Germany for World War I. When you're ready, go ahead and pause the podcast and start the video in order to fill in the blanks on your notes. All right, let's go ahead and check our answers. When it came to punishing Germany, Woodrow Wilson, President of the United States, believed that Germany should not be punished. He recognized that by punishing Germany, the German people could become angry, the German people could become hateful, and an angry and hateful Germany could cause problems, possibly leading to another world war. This is something Woodrow Wilson wanted to avoid. Which is why Woodrow Wilson strongly believed that the League of Nations needed to be created. If you don't remember, the League of Nations is basically Woodrow Wilson's pet project, a group of kind of referee peacekeeping countries who would come together to ensure fairness and equality for all countries in order to avoid war. Woodrow Wilson highly, highly supported and believed the League of Nations was necessary. When it came to blaming Germany for World War I, Woodrow Wilson recognized that Germany was not the only country involved in World War I and that it had been the bullet of a Serbian nationalist from the Black Hand that had killed the heir to the Austrian-Hungarian throne. Given that information, Woodrow Wilson did not believe that Germany should receive full blame for World War I. These beliefs were very different from those of David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. David Lloyd George believed that Germany should in fact be punished. Germany should be punished because the British people needed and wanted to see Germany punished. The British people were upset that Germany had given Austria-Hungary a blank check. The British people were upset that Germany had invaded neutral Belgium. And therefore, the British people believed that Germany did have to receive a punishment. David Lloyd George, their leader, was happy in ensuring Germany was punished. But David Lloyd George believed that the punishment should be a fair punishment, a punishment that fit the crime. And even though Germany was going to be punished, Germany should still be left economically strong enough to be able to take care of itself financially, to be able to trade with other countries, to be able to kind of pick itself up when it came to providing jobs and money and food and resources for its own people. When it came to the League of Nations, David Lloyd George was kind of like 50-50 on the League of Nations. 
He believed that the League of Nations was a good idea in creating fairness and equality, but he worried about how much power the League of Nations would take away from his own country. Because the League of Nations is asking for fairness and equality, that means that the League of Nations is asking for countries to stop practicing imperialism, and it's also asking for countries to stop practicing militarism. For Great Britain, imperialism and militarism is basically what, basically what has allowed Great Britain to be a strong, powerful, industrialized country. And David Lloyd George realizes that if his country has to stop practicing imperialism and militarism, his country is going to lose some of its power. And so David Lloyd George is kind of 50-50 about the League of Nations. He likes the fairness and equality idea, but does not like the fact that it could basically take away some of his country's power. When it comes to blaming Germany, David Lloyd George believes that Germany should receive some blame. Not all the blame, but some blame. Germany does have to be found somewhat guilty because it provided a blank check to Austria-Hungary and it also attacked neutral Belgium. Now, when it comes to France, we know that the leader Georges Clemenceau is what we would call the tiger. He's very angry about Germany having attacked uh, France with the Schleifland plan. This is not only the first time France was attacked, France had previously been attacked before that during the Franco-Prussian War. And so we know that Georges Clemenceau wants German blood. And because he wants German blood, he wants to see Germany severely punished. He wants Germany to have to pay reparations, which is payback money. He wants Germany demilitarized, which means Germany's military shrunk, Germany's military power taken away, and he wants to see Germany lose land. Georges Clemenceau also does not want the League of Nations. He believes that the League of Nations is basically just a group of dreamers. Fairness and equality sound nice, but in reality, fairness and equality never work. And so he believes the League of Nations is a waste of time. We don't need it. We need to punish Germany. We need to have strict rules. And that's the end of the question. When it comes to blaming Germany for World War I, Georges Clemenceau believes that Germany should receive all of the blame. Germany is going to be, according to Georges Clemenceau, Germany is going to be the reason why World War I started. Georges Clemenceau points out that if Germany had never given Austria-Hungary the blank check, Austria-Hungary would have never felt confident and Austria-Hungary would have never declared war on Serbia. If you take a look at each of these three countries and their different ideas on punishing Germany, the League of Nations, and blaming Germany for World War I, we can see that the United States is pretty much going to be the country that's kind of taking the nicer, more fair stance. France is the country that's taking the harsher, more strict, severe stance. And Great Britain's kind of like in between. So what was the outcome of the PPC? What was the outcome of this meeting, the Paris Peace Conference, where the Treaty of Versailles, the TOV, was written? Well, the Paris Peace Conference, like we mentioned uh, last unit, led to the creation of many peace treaties that officially ended World War I. Now, in this unit, Unit 6, on the rise of totalitarian regimes, we are still only going to focus on one of those treaties, and that treaty is the Treaty of Versailles known as the TOV. Now, after much debate, the TOV was signed by the PPC delegates, by the government representatives from the world powers. And what's important to notice is that this PPC meeting was not a very calm, collaborative, happy meeting. It was actually a meeting with a lot of intense arguing, a lot of intense fighting, many different world powers, minor powers, colonial countries got up and left in the middle of the meeting. It was a very hot, debated meeting because not all of the delegates agreed on what the Treaty of Versailles should say. However, they did eventually come to an agreement and it was eventually signed. Now, one of the people who was particularly disappointed with what the Treaty of Versailles said was President Woodrow Wilson of the United States. Although U.S. President Woodrow Wilson wanted his entire 14 points document put into the TOV, this did not happen. 
Now, if you don't remember what the 14 points document was or what the 14 points document said, you might want to go back to the data analysis assignment we reviewed during the Venn diagram, or you might want to go back to your previous notes, Unit 5.11 from Unit 5. Now, even though he was disappointed that his entire 14 points document did not get put into the TOV, he was at least happy about one thing. And the one thing he was happy about was that he was able to get the League of Nations written into the Treaty of Versailles. Now, how he got this League of Nations written into the Treaty of Versailles was Woodrow Wilson compromised. When it came to the League of Nations, the British and the French leaders basically told Woodrow Wilson, your 14-point document is a list of a bunch of little fairy tale, peace-loving requirements that we are not going to agree to. Now, we will agree to allowing you to create the League of Nations, to creating this international peacekeeping organization, but if we agree to allow you to create this League of Nations, then you have to forget about all of the other 14-point bullet points. Woodrow Wilson decides to compromise. He decides to leave out a ton of his 14 points, bullet points in order to get the League of Nations written into the Treaty of Versailles. And by getting the League of Nations written in the Treaty of Versailles, that means that this peacekeeping group of referees can now be legally created and can now legally take action to maintain peace and fairness and equality after World War I. Now, a lot of countries are going to be very unhappy that Woodrow Wilson compromised, specifically countries like Germany. Countries like Germany were really hoping and relying that Woodrow Wilson would not compromise and that he would get all of his 14-point bullet points into the Treaty of Versailles, especially the parts of the 14 points that talked about not treating Germany harshly and not blaming Germany harshly. On the other hand, some of the countries at the PPC are going to be happy with this compromise. Some of the countries at the PPC, like the colonial countries, the victim countries like India and China, they were very happy Woodrow Wilson compromised because the League of Nations was basically going to ensure that these colonial countries eventually got their self-determination, meaning that they eventually got their freedom. Now, there are four major provisions, meaning four major sections in the Treaty of Versailles. The first one is the section that talks about the League of Nations, the section that talks about territorial losses, the section that talks about military restrictions, and the section that talks about the War Guilt Clause. We're going to now jump into looking at these four different provisions or sections of the Treaty of Versailles. Now, we know that the League of Nations is created. Woodrow Wilson compromises because he compromises. The other two countries, Great Britain and France, agreed to allow him to create this peacekeeping group. And this image does a really nice job of showing us just how excited Woodrow Wilson felt. He really felt that by creating this League of Nations peacekeeping group, he was offering to the world this great opportunity to avoid any future war. Now, specifically, the League of Nations is going to be a group that is created because of language written into the Treaty of Versailles. The delegates at the PPC agreed to create a League of Nations and thus wrote it into the Treaty of Versailles. This is the one thing Woodrow Wilson would not compromise. He stood his ground and he argued that the Treaty of Versailles had to have language creating the League of Nations. Now, according to the Treaty of Versailles, the League of Nations was going to be made up of 27 nations, and these 27 nations could not be enemy countries from the Central Powers, could not be neutral countries who refused to get involved in World War I. Therefore, the 27 countries that made up the League of Nations were going to be countries that were on the Allied Powers side, meaning countries that won World War I, and countries who actually wanted to be involved and part of the Allied Powers side. Now, part one of our podcast is about to end. When it ends, go ahead and start part two.